Hafide Todus Hamsu, thank you for your participation in today's joint virtual informational briefing. This joint virtual informational briefing is convened by the Committee on Heritage and the Arts, Parks, Guam Products, Haganya Revitalization, Self Determination, and Regional Affairs. It is held in conjunction with the Committee on Federal and Foreign Affairs, Telecommunications, Technology, and Labor. For the record, in accordance with the open government law, public hearing notices were given to all senators, stakeholders, and all main media broadcasting outlets, with the first notice being issued on Wednesday, August 12th, 2020, and the second notice being issued on Monday, August 17th, 2020. The public notice for today's briefing was also posted on the legislature's website at www.guamlegislature.org. The time is now 5.37. The virtual informational briefing is now called to order. Sidhuis Maasi for all of your virtual attendance to this afternoon's virtual hearing. The committee will focus on the fiscal impact of the compacts of free association. So we have a, a, a very full panel with us today and I'm very, very appreciative of that. So what I will do is I will start with the, the senators and then move on to our guests who are here. I will start with the senator who is here convening this with me. We have Senator Regine Biscoe-Lee, Sidious Maasi, for working with me on this. And I look forward to your virtual informational briefing tomorrow night as well, which will build on what we're going over today. Then um, we also have the vice speaker, um, Senator Talina Nelson, Sidious Maasi for being here. And uh, um, I will just go through the order as best I can because everybody, I guess Zoom does its own random ordering of us. But we have the Legislative Secretary, uh, Senator Amanda Shelton, to do us Masi for being here. Um, and then next, I believe we have um, the Minority Leader, uh, Senator Tello Taitawi. We have Senator Will Castro, and let's just make sure that I expand this that I haven't missed anybody. So just give me a heads up if somehow, um, amidst all the cubes, <laughs> I miss someone, it's unintentional, of course. So I am glad to have you all here. And I wanna go into also acknowledging our guests who are here to provide information for us. So we have the governor's chief advisor on military and regional affairs, Ms. Carlotta Leon Guerrero. We have UOG Assistant Professor of Economic and Community Systems, Peter Barcinas. We have as well from the Un University of Guam, Dr. Serena Dresbic. We have uh, Monica Guerrero from the Bureau of Statistics and Plans. We have the GURA Director, Ray Tapajna. We have the Department of Public Health and Social Services. Director Art San Augustine, um, if he's not in quite yet, he's making his way in. We're also going to be having uh, both the deputy directors of DPHSS, Dr. Lori Duenas and Terry Uggen. We do have Bertha Tajaron from the Department of Public Health and Social Services as well, as well as we're expecting uh, Dr. Keneshiro and Tess Archangel to be making their way in. So I would also like to thank GMH, DOC, uh, so the Guam Memorial Health Authority, the Department of Corrections, the Judiciary, and other agencies that will be providing testimony in the coming days. So I'd like to go over general rules for virtual informational briefing. So again, thank you so much for being here. And before we, we open up the discussions from participants and have our questions, we will go through these uh, general rules of conduct. So the conduct of this virtual informational briefing shall be as follows. 
All participants must buy, uh, abide by the rules of conduct and quality assurance standards, including broadcasting from a quiet room with little to no interruptions. The use of virtual backgrounds is not permitted and um, I believe everybody's on board, but to, to please make yourself visible at all times. So broadcasting from a room with adequate lighting, specifically to ensure that a participant's face is not backlit, but visible at all times when speaking especially. And please make sure that when called upon, you are unmuted and that you speak clearly into your microphone. The chair will recognize individuals who have been confirmed as participants. Individuals shall first be recognized before speaking and then shall state their name and title for record keeping purposes. Per item on the agenda, so we broke it down into just four basic categories. And as we move through each category, we'll go around one, maybe two times among the senators to ask questions. So the order of questioning will begin with Senator Bisco Lee, who is convening this informational briefing with me, and then on to other senators. Each panel member will be allowed to pose one question, and then uh, as time allows or as the, the questions, um, if, if there are still continue to be questions, uh, we will do our best to have a second round as is necessary. So the motives of any senator or any individual participating in this informational briefing is not permitted. Any violation of this rule of conduct will result in removal from the virtual meeting room by the host. And because we are a pretty full panel, we, we want to hear um, comprehensive answers, but if we can all be conscientious of the time, both in the asking of the questions and then in the responses. So the items for discussion at this informational briefing are first, we wanted this to, as I said, just go over some basics because maybe not everybody on Guam and leaders included, maybe we're not all on the same page. So we're going to look at what is compact impact. We'll look a little bit at the brief history of compact impact for Guam. And then third, we'll look at issues related to calculating compact impact. That has a history of its own. It can be a rather lengthy history, but we'll, we'll try to just touch on it enough to inform us that we understand how we're moving forward. And then the fourth part, we'll be looking at the fiscal impact of the Compacts of Free Association. So we'll now begin the actual joint infra, uh, virtual informational briefing. For Guam's leaders and the community itself, it's important to understand what some of the terms that we use pretty commonly are. We use terms like compact impact, COFA, and reimbursement, but what do those terms mean really? And are we in the community on the same page in regards to them? Their impact on Guam is great. Yet the impact of the Compacts of Free Association and whether or not the US is adequately reimbursing us for those impacts don't seem to get the attention that they deserve. Now that we are going over the budget with a fine tooth comb, more than ever, it's important for all of us to understand what the Compacts of Free Association are and how the degree to which the US appropriately lives up to their obligations of reimbursement impacts our government finances. We need to understand whether it makes it easier or more difficult to make our annual governmental budget uh, meet all of its, its uh, needs. The data we'll go over today and the understanding this conversation will bring will give us tools for understanding what types of actions are important ones to pursue in addressing compact impact issues. So with this, um, I'm going to uh, switch to just a really basic question. And that is, if somebody wants to define whether it's um, 
Carlotta Leon Guerrero or um, Dr. Uh, sorry, Dressbeck or uh, Mr. Barcenas, if you want to just help us understand what would a basic definition of compact impact be? I can, I can tackle it. Okay, great. Um, compact is that because of this treaty relationship with uh, Micronesia that the United States entered into, um, in exchange for getting security rights uh, um, and defense rights to Micronesia, they, they um, gave access to Guam and to the rest of the United States. So, and then they said to us and said to them that when you come in there and you avail yourselves of these government services, we do not want to cause any adverse consequences to these governments. So we will... Um, address those adverse consequences. And so that is the impact, uh, increased um, education expenses, uh, English as second language. Um, many people are coming from um, a healthcare system where they could be in their 50s and advanced cancer and have never seen a doctor. So by the time they enter into public health systems, um, they're coming from a struggling healthcare system. When they come into the schools, it's a struggling uh, education system. And so our government is dealing with the needs of an urgent of an urgent nature to a vulnerable population. So we calculate that, and that is called impact to our government. Those costs of providing those services that America has committed to Micronesia. Guam is uh, providing those costs, providing those services. Then we add up those costs and that becomes our impact, uh, um, our report for impact. And that's where we've been arm wrestling with the federal government for decades on, on the, the calculation of this impact. I, I think that's a very good definition and, and a, a couple of things stood out to me. And it's something that we can keep in mind both for today and for tomorrow's informational briefing is with, uh, with the areas that we're talking about where the US does have these treaties that their economies and their health systems may indeed be struggling. And so there may be some action that our leaders uh, would be interested in pursuing for the health of our entire region and ourselves. And the other was you mentioned Guam. Is Guam the only area that uh, deals with this compact impact um, or are there other areas? There, there are other And um, the, the migration has grown into the greater United States. And so uh, you have Oklahoma, Arkansas, Washington State, you have a number of jurisdictions beyond the islands that are now joining uh, in, in, one of the things that we all just participated in was a GAO study of the impacts. And so you saw what all the states were saying and all those states were saying they want their congressional leaders to change the definition in the law of affected jurisdiction. So right now, Arkansas cannot get any federal funding for dealing with the RMI nuclear radiated patients because when they go to the law, it says only Guam, CNMI and Hawaii and American Samoa can get funding. So they want that language changed. So there's uh, the, it, the impact is greater than just um, Guam and CNMI and Hawaii. Right, and um, as you're seeing in, in some of the reading I've done recently, um, in those three areas, we get about 50% of the impact, but uh, we're now seeing that among all the other states, uh, with certain states in particular, they're, they're seeing the impact of the other 50% who are, um, the term is compact migrants, um, people who, are able to migrate out of their homelands um, to areas in the US because of these treaties. So um, I will go ahead because I know that there are several senators here and they each have questions. I will go ahead and turn this over to Senator Lee so that she may ask a, a question. Thank you, 
Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you everybody so much for joining us. Um, and thank you, Senator Leon Guerrero for um, explaining to us um, a little bit of the history behind Compact Impact and where we are today and who's involved. Um, I just wanted to clarify, maybe if you could for the listening audience and for our um, the people on, on Zoom with us, uh, what the status is for on, on gaining federal approval for the calculation of the impact uh, to our community. Thank you, and, and I'm pleased that there's some other people that are on the panel that can discuss it a little further. One of the first things that Governor uh, Leon Guerrero did when she came into office is uh, sent a letter to um, Interior and said, we're not gonna submit the annual report because the, the these reports have been going nowhere. They get stamped with uh, an Interior letter saying, uh, we don't agree with anything of how they calculated it. So the governor sub said, we're not going to submit to you until we can answer all of these concerns. So then uh, Bureau of Stats and Plans wrote a grant to uh, OIA to get the funding to tackle the methodology. It makes no sense for us to spend all of our efforts to submit the same report every year when we have been told there's five things that you need to fix. So we're, we're committed uh, uh, to, to fixing those five things. And so a grant is in the work. So they might be able to speak more to the progress they, they are making or not because of COVID and, and what they're framing up. Thank you. Well, We'll definitely be touching more bases on that because you bring to light a very important part of what we're dealing with. And we do have two university professors here that are conducting a study as to how to fix that calculation. So we will definitely be uh, following that up, uh, Senator Lee. Next, uh, Vice Speaker, if you have a question. No, I don't have any questions at this time. So just Masi for being here. I appreciate your interest. And um, I'm sure at a later point in the conversation, you'll have some questions. Um, next, we have the Legislative Secretary, uh, Senator Amanda Shelton. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Senator Titano. And thank you to the whole panel for being here today. Uh, we have uh, folks from all over the place and I appreciate your time. Obviously, this is a very comprehensive panel for, um, for a very big topic for us to be discussing today. So maybe um, Senator Leon Guerrero, if you can um, share with us, what is the, um, the amount, uh, share with us the amount that uh, we've been short in the in compact impact. Thank you very, thank you very much, Senator. Um, the last year that we submitted a report, uh, the last administration submitted in two, eight, 2018, and it was for the year 2017. And um, in that year, it was $148 million. And of that 148 million, 67 million was to the Department of Education alone. 37 million was in public safety. Um, 39 million was in healthcare, and of that, 39 million, 14 million alone was to GMH. So we submitted for 148 million and got back like 14.5 million. So this will give you an idea of how huge the gap is. And so um, we're hoping that with the methodology getting fixed, and we, we tighten it up and they figure out one of the stumbling blocks is how to calculate the positive impact to our economy from the, um, the, the work and the efforts of a migrant workforce. And so if they can figure that out, if the number shakes out, if we submit at 148 and when you add all the positives, it shakes down to 120, that's still better than the 14.5 that we're getting. So it's the effort is to get to a number that everybody can agree on and has the best chance of getting funded. Okay, thank you. And can you tell us, um, do the other jurisdictions also 
uh, face the same problems? Are they being shorted this amount, the same amount? Um, the other jurisdictions, yes. Um, Hawaii is submitting um, at around 190 million a year and they'll get back about anywhere from nine to 16 million depending on when a mistake gets corrected or not. So the other jurisdictions like Oklahoma and Arkansas and, and they don't they don't even get to submit a report because there's uh, there's no pot of money that's been designated to deal with them. It only is Guam, CNMI, American Samoa, and Hawaii. So other jurisdictions, uh, what we found out when we participated in the GAO uh, study, they all came out, the General Accounting Office, they're, um, they're part of Congress, and they were asked by Senator Lisa Murkowski to come out and go to all the jurisdictions and study this impact. And public health really participated in this. Bureau of Stats and Plans drove it and we took it way serious. And so we learned how the states might be, uh, they'll, the, like they'll have a program where they can move people into emergency funding for immig uh, non-legal immigrant population about to give birth. Very specific categories that they were finding. And, and so we learned a lot um, it, by going into this process, but I, I would say that the other jurisdictions are also dealing with it. So there is a hope if uh, we, we find that compromise of following these GAO recommendations for the, for the formula to calculate this, that you know, we could come to some kind of better agreement and see more funds in the future. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. So do a for that line of questioning and uh, definitely between today and tomorrow and perhaps some follow-up roundtable briefings, we will, we will get to pursue some actions that will provide some relief. Yes. Uh, next, we have uh, the minority leader, Senator Taidegui, if you have a question. Yeah, see just Masi, Madam Chair, and half a day, everyone. Uh, good evening. Hi, Carlotta. Good to see you. So, Carlotta, um, you were talking about the methodology on, on how they're going to calculate to be more fair to all the uh, territories as well as the states. And you mentioned, um, you know, they're still trying to calculate this. Um, right now, 2023 is the deadline for the 30 million that they put together right now for the compact mm -hmm. impact. And they are negotiating right now. Um, who's sitting at the table on those negotiations? And what do you know so far that some pieces of that contract that might be, um, that you might know of are offhand that they are increasing this amount of money? Well, I, I know that, um, I know that everybody that's at the table, but I know that this is something that uh, um, is gonna be given, the strategy is going to be something in the next uh, informational hearing. Is is that correct? Am I uh, am I supposed to go on to the DC strategy at this time, or is that oh, for tomorrow? That, no, that, that's okay. Yeah. I don't need to go ahead, ahead and everything, you know. So that that's okay. But um, I, I'll wait for that. I guess it's a question that'll be answered later on in there um, with regards to to that. So, anyways. I guess I'll just wait for that answer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, yeah. I, I may have to step out for a bit, but uh, I'll try and log back on. In. Thank you. Okay, because we will be going into more detail about how they're uh, reconfiguring the, the calculations, and I know you'll want to hear that. Okay, next we also have, um, is Senator Will Castro still here? Okay, but we do have uh, Senator Joe Sanagustin uh, joining us. So, Senator, we, we're starting off with just kind of the basics. Uh, what is compact impact and um, which states and territories are affected? Did you have a, a general question like that before we move into some of the more the nuts and bolts of it? No, th thank you, Madam Chair. I have, I have no questions because I, I like to see how they're their formula is, is put together because when I was with the Board of Education, we were always uh, very frustrated that uh, the Department of Education was spending something like $22 million a year. It was estimated that it, they were just spending so much and they can they can have a recording of how many students were from the Compact Impact. And it, 
we just couldn't figure out how we can get the federal government to start reimbursing uh, GovGuam, at least for DOE part. Now, but in general, I know that it impacts GMH, it impacts public, it impacts every part of our government. And it's just amazing how we, we can't seem to get the formula right. And, and this is not something new. This has been going on for years. We, we need to grab a hold of it. And uh, Senator Carlotta there is knows that this is something that needs to get resolved and so we can move on because uh, at the end of the day, we're the only one getting shortchanged. It's as bad as the EITC, where we're paying for a federal mandate. And, and, and this compact impact is a federal mandate that we need to entertain everybody that comes to Guam. But we get no funding to, to basically even get to 50%. We're, we're, we're at this junction where somebody's got to do something in the federal government to help us out because we're footing the bill for something that they cost on us. But thank you, Madam Chair. Sadhuis Masi for joining us and, and listening in. And I think you'll be pleased when we get to um, hearing from Dr. Dresbeck and uh, Mr. Barcinas. They'll talk about the progress that they're making with the calculations. And I believe GDOE is at the forefront of those recalculations. And uh, we, we are hoping that it's really going to make some difference. And as you said, with the unfunded mandates and the lack of appropriate reimbursement from these U.S. treaties and these U.S. obligations, it, it really um, is when we need tens of millions of dollars to meet our needs, it's tens of millions of dollars that we're we're not being reimbursed and we're expecting or the US federal government is is actually placing on our taxpayers' shoulders. You know, the lighting in here is getting really strange. <laughs> um, I'm trying to move this around a little bit. I think I'll shift to this direction. Um, and, and so uh, I think you'll appreciate very much what we talk about next. So maybe um, if someone, um, maybe Mr. Barcinas or, or Dr. Dresbeck, <laughs> Do you know how many compact migrants there are in total right now? Uh, what kind of numbers are we dealing with? This is uh, Pete Barcinas. I think okay. one of the, um, the way to approach this whole conversation, at least from uh, a documentation uh, uh, angle, is to refer to official processes, meaning the uh, COFA census that was taken recently. So all those would be our, our baseline for using official numbers. I think a lot of times we fall to those uh, scenarios where uh, we, we call it in, in uh, community economic development, development work, anic data. We have data that uh, is being used very loosely and not qualified to some form of research process, a survey, something that, that's been recognized. So, um, Madam Chair, you, you opened up a, a very big question on what is COFA? And really, to answer that question, it depends on who you're having that conversation with, whether you're do dealing with the federal government, an agency, uh, a country in, in Micronesia, depending on the, the issue or interest, there's a lot of forums and, and discussion windows where uh, we're all over the place in terms of trying to get a grip on, on what is it that we want to understand. So I think the, um, the grant that was uh, entered into with uh, Office of Interior uh, became the, the start point for this formality of having the right conversations and doing the studies. So I think the, in answer to your question of how many citizens, COFA citizens are on Guam, the, uh, the census, the COFA census really uh, speaks to that. I think we have 18,000. And I think the, the important number is uh, how does that look in the bigger scheme of things? Uh, it's a complex, uh, migration is a complex issue. And the, a lot of uh, what uh, you enter into when you do cost benefit analysis, we're using economic 
models to describe social economic conditions that the population uh, under study is experiencing. So when you deal with assimilation issues, acculturation, it's a whole complex uh, backdrop that we have to be careful uh, what references we are using. And again, you open up with the, what is the definition? And these definitions are, are established by the uh, legislation that created the compact. So it's, it's really comprehensive. And I think the, the approach that the university is doing uh, with regard to the deliverables and the grant that uh, Gulf Guam received is to develop a, a broad-based COFA monograph. And we use the monograph as a reference to describe what is the context that we want to understand and how do we uh, describe that in terms of quality data, how is it accessed and how is how it is used. And I think that's the, uh, the framework that allows us to be on the same page when we uh, use definitions. And our definitions do not count if we're different from the federal uh, statute definitions. So we want to try and align those aspects so that we have a, a common base to show where those gaps are. And then work towards the middle to understanding how it, how it could be used so that we move forward together. So I think um, in short, the university was approached to really engage in helping address what is the best approach to conduct this research and look at it from a comprehensive uh, standpoint and get all these facets of understanding COFA in its many dimensions into a uh, framework that works for policymakers, works for line agencies that are required to report and especially the practitioners that are involved in the daily grind of compiling the information. And I think when we, we again call that in, in community development work, link data to policy. And I think if we, if we describe that in, in its uh, uh, true nature, then we're, we're not mixing uh, different references uh, and how those numbers could be used. I can write at this um, juncture in terms of where we're at in, in, in the project. Uh, the pandemic has really set uh, the project forward momentum back a couple months, but we're doing what we can while waiting for uh, us to get back on a real research track. And I think what we're finding out is these kinds of conversations and interest in what information is valuable for for these kinds of discussions. Uh, the other uh, point that I would like to raise is that we also have to set the limitations on the study. Uh, there's a lot of things that we could cover in the short term. And those some of those points are being addressed now. But I think over time, we need to really own the data that is being generated and have the understanding across the federal agencies in the same way the military buildup is also causing issues for, for us to look at federal issues. Uh, so I think your, your, the university is positioned to, to tap its uh, knowledge reservoir of expertise. And as well as being a land grant uh, university, we have our network across the US that also have some familiarity and experience in conducting similar cost benefit analysis. So a lot of those conversations are ongoing and we hope to get some real traction on uh, getting to these uh, good questions about what is in it for Guam in terms of how we report the uh, quality data, how we access it, and also ensure that the trustworthiness and, and uh, confirmability of really the research process is something that the, uh, the federal partners are not going to challenge once we speak their language.
So we hope to move uh, that needle in, in the right way so that everyone is on board. Juice Mossy for providing that information um, and a real understanding as to what's going on and and how we're you know we're starting to really look at like you said trustworthy uh, figures and and it's complex as you mentioned a uh, part of what through, went through my mind when you were talking about the complexities is we're dealing with these compacts, these US treaties essentially, and each one are, are different one to the other, which adds to the complexity and us looking at the impact because it's not a blanket thing, it's not a one thing. Um, each treaty negotiation is gonna impact us probably a little bit differently, I would say. So, um, uh, and I guess before we move on to the next section, uh, while we're still here in sort of the basics of things, is our understanding that the compact migrant numbers are increasing? It, it looked to me like they were, but you're more familiar with, like I haven't read the compact um, migrant census. Um, so maybe either Mr. Barcinas or Dr. Dresbach. I can, I think Monica can, can defer to that. And, and I do want to get to Monica as well, because I know that Monica had some points to make. Oh, thank you. Uh, with regard to the, the compact numbers, um, we have been discussions even in prior administrations that uh, it is increasing, but uh, we've seen indication that it may be stabling off because uh, so there have been discussions with the migrants uh, coming to Guam and then moving off to the mainland. So like you had mentioned, uh, Senator uh, Carole Leon Guerrero about moving to Arkansas and other areas in that, in that respect. So using Guam as, as a point to, as a stepping stone and then moving on, onwards to the mainland. So with regard to this past uh, COFA enumeration, there was a slight increase from the past uh, one that was done in 2013. But I do have to caution you, the one in 2013 was using the 2010 census. So there was no actual enumeration taking place. And uh, interior officials would mention to um, our office that at that time, that it was more cost effective to look at uh, existing data at that time rather than to uh, fund uh, uh, an actual survey for the 2013 enumeration. So I do believe it is increasing, but maybe not as, as, as drastic as it was in previous decades. That's a very good point. I can see how we might serve as a stepping stone and so that our numbers may not be increasing as rapidly as, as perhaps other areas that are now on the receiving end of us being a stepping stone and, and that's, I think that's important for us to understand as we're calculating all of this. Um, what are our numbers here? And then to what degree they're incre increasing? Is there some stability um, and so forth? But, you know, we can continue to ask these basic questions as well, but um, we can move on to the second part of this about a brief history of the compact impact reimbursement. So. Uh, Carlotta and Monica have talked a little bit about the history of this. Um, Senator Lee, did you have any questions about wanting to understand some of the history of the compact impact, uh, either just the reimbursement or things related to the impact? No, I'm fine. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, Vice Speaker. Ooh. You went the opposite way, actually. Oh, I'm just yeah. listening to the dialogue right now. So if I have any questions, I'll let you know. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm absorbing a lot of information myself. Um, Senator Shelton? I'm not sure, but let me, let me go over um, some of the questions I was thinking of. So I mentioned earlier that maybe part of what our discussion will help us think about is 
there might be ways to support the economies and the healthcare systems in the neighboring islands that have these US treaties. And um, that might be a way of just improving the health and being of our entire region and um, maybe stabilizing numbers for all of us. Um, I think as neighbors, it would be a really good thing for us to continue to look for ways that we're also helping support and improve and stabilize their economies in healthcare. So maybe Carlotta again, and then others, please let me know if you have information you wanna share as well. Um, have there been efforts like that? Has Guam been part of trying to um, support their economies as well as ours, their healthcare systems as well as ours? Are you familiar with any of that or is this? Senator, the, 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 Senator the way we support them is uh, bearing such a heavy load of the education and healthcare needs of uh, many FAS citizens that have come to Guam. Uh, that's a relief to them. Uh, all the families that come over here uh, for healthcare reasons or for education, that's, that le lessens the burden on their government. So it's an odd way to phrase it, but the way that we help them is that uh, we, we meet that obligation in our schools and in our, in our, in our healthcare systems. Um, I feel that if I, if I could just give you one of the things you said, a history of the funding. And I think that what's important for your colleagues to understand is that Guam, none of us, not any of us, not Hawaii, none of us have ever gotten any money from the federal government because of reimbursement of the reports that we submit. Not once have they ever said, okay, we're giving you this annual amount because we agree on your GMH figures or your DOE figures. That, that's not the case. It was um, uh, a pot of money uh, I think uh, Congressman Underwood did this, and at the time it was it was so helpful. But you know, he he is he is saying running around saying you got to we got to go back and revisit this pot of money. And I'm sure this is something Congressman St. Nicholas is concerned about as well. But um, um, so it's this thirty million dollar pie that gets divided up. So the slice that we get is just based on the head count. It's not because they agree to what, what is happening to our, our government services. So I think everybody should be aware of that, but, the, but our government bearing this burden is a tremendous help to the regional governments. Hawaii is bearing a huge burden as well uh, for the Marshall Islands because most of the Marshallese go to Hawaii and not here so much. I don't know if that answers your question, but it, it it kind of makes everybody flip it around. Of we we don't have to really go over there to help them. We're helping them here because their people are coming over here and filling up our systems. Yeah, and it is an interesting way to look at it. Um, I was thinking because, of course, part of your background is at Zuda Foundation, and so I know that you've done medical missions out there and you send textbooks out there and stuff. But, but maybe as a government, we haven't yet um, found ways to really work with them or um, find other ways to support improving their economies and their healthcare systems. Um, I know we've looked well, at I healthcare. I know we've looked at um, regional medicine, if you will, of bringing medicine out here <laughs> in larger amounts as a region. So I think of some efforts like that, but maybe you have other thoughts. Well, I think that I can I talk about something that the governor has started and um, Hawaii has for years and years been pushing for um, members from uh, COF, the COFA states to have access to Medicaid, to get back onto Medicaid. They were on Medicaid from 85 to 95 and then they got knocked off. So Hawaii is trying to get them back. So the governor agrees with that. And then when we were in Micronesia uh, uh, recently for the President Penuelo's inauguration, she met with the, the leadership 
And she told them that she is going to be pushing for that, but she has the idea that it should be expanded to wherever they are so that it, you're, if you get Medicaid, if you're in Chuuk, that the Medicaid works for you in Chuuk, that you don't have to be in Oregon for it to kick in. So that's a way that the governor has figured out how to help them and help us. And if they have Medicaid there, that means that their clinics and their hospitals would have a more reliable um, you know, funding stream. And that might be one of the things that uh, reduces the need to migrate out. So it's, uh, we take a big burden off of them with just by providing services, but the governor of late is, is pushing to expand Medicaid to wherever they are, Chuuk, Ponte Palau, Majuro. I'm glad you uh, you clarified that because I think I was thinking too um, in, in too much of an insular way, so that when I saw the governor had written that, I was thinking it was wherever they were in whatever state or whatever territory, but I didn't realize it would actually be within their own homeland. So I think yes. that's definitely something we'll want to continue discussing even further tomorrow as well when we're, we're talking about these uh, different possibilities of what we could be asking for. And um, so you mentioned this pie, this $30 million that gets split up. So does that mean <clears throat> that Guam's numbers of, of reimbursement by headcount that it stays pretty much the same? Has it always been around 14.6 million or give or take? It has been, but of uh, the last year, it took a hit uh, because of um, Bureau of Stats and Plans can go into this in a greater detail, but, um, and we're struggling over the definition of, uh, and, and it's just amazing at this, after decades of this relationship, we're still struggling over the definition of uh, what is a migrant? How far do you count? So when we heard that first it was just uh, migrants, uh, people coming over and their children, and then we heard that it went to grandchildren, and then it, then it became things like uh, grandchildren, but like if they're in the house and they're not married and their children, and it just got really confusing. And uh, Bureau of Stats uh, really glommed onto this and had a lot to say about it in their comments to GAO, as did every state. When you look at what the GAO report, every single state had uniformity on, on a, a bunch of issues. And one of them was on um, um, clearing that up, that definition, how to count and define is still confusing. Yeah, and I'm glad you bring that up because I, I think we have, a, at least a, the way that I was taught at the university, um, that in, in places like territories, we have a tendency to not give ourselves a, a lot of credit. And, and so with this, maybe in finding out that our calculation hasn't been right, maybe we're very critical with ourselves. But I think as you're mentioning and has been mentioned by um, Peter Barcinas and so forth, is that nobody's gotten this correct um, <laughs> because it is so complex. And um, with GAO, I mean, this is one of the things that I want to ask um, Dr. Dresbach and, and Peter Barcinas in a minute is um, whether GAO has actually given us any guidance over the last 12 or 14 years. But, but I'll, I'll save that question just for a minute. Um, so Monica, can you tell us, do you know about what our slice of the pie has been over the years? Well, Is it um, as, as Carlotta had mentioned, uh, you know, in our, the past uh, COFA enumeration that was done, uh, what, 2018, um, uh, as you, everyone knows that there has been, uh, the Census Bureau had cited uh, miscalculation error. So uh, uh, GAO had reported there will be a, it's actually an overpayment to Guam by about, I guess, about $14 million. So the reason for the miscalculation or an error on the part of the US Census Bureau was because of the marital status variable. The Census Bureau failed to, failed to count in Hawaii uh, US-born children under 15 years of age. 
So uh, this would uh, garner uh, Hawaii's count by about 6,000 to 8,000 more uh, compact migrants. So this would cause Guam to uh, have a reduced uh, allocation in, as well as CNMI and American Samoa in subsequent years because they would have to upwork the allocation to Hawaii and reduce uh, funding levels to Guam as well as the other areas. So this is, um, it's important to understand um, how we move forward in terms of the calculation. And it's interesting how when I was listening to Pete about uh, the project coming on board, and I just wanted to mention, and we had this conversation, Pete and I had this conversation also with Dr. Dreshba, that we must go in this uh, to bring in the key, key stakeholders, a like member of the legislature, as well as possibly even GAO or Interior, because they need to be uh, involved at the forefront with us in developing this calculation, because we do not want to complete the project. And after a year, two years, and then we submit our, our report to find out that GAO doesn't agree with it. So it's very important that everyone is on top of it in the beginning so that if there's mm -hmm. any questions or um, um, issues in terms of the calculations, it's brought up then, then at the tail end. So that's why I wanted to mention that uh, university is on top of that and they are aware of that. So. Thank you. Yeah, and, and again, um, it, it makes it real important for us to have that clear definition, for us to know what our numbers are and, and how they are in other areas as well. If they're increasing elsewhere, like ho especially Hawaii or NMI, that makes a real difference in the way that we're considered as well, it seems like. so. Yeah, uh, and I do remember hearing that kerfuffle, if you will, um, in Hawaii, where Hawaii was really upset, <laughs> um, and I'm sure understandably so. Um, did anybody have anything else they wanted to add onto that before we get more into the actual calculations? Um, maybe a little bit about what some of the calculation issues have been and how they're being resolved. Um, okay, so if if not, um, yes, Madam Senator, Chair, I, oh, sorry, Mr. I have, I have one in in um, response to your early earlier uh, uh, question on what structures exist that um, you know sponsors these conversations for the region. You have organizations like the uh, Pacific Island Legislature, the leadership on the Micronesian Island Forum, they have resolutions and communiques that really capture detailed discussions from all areas having input on common issues. And I think there's a wealth of, of background information on those kinds of uh, discussions that could be revisited because those, for, for the region, the, the way we contextualize how uh, COFA is, is, should be looked at from our side is from a brain drain or a brain gain reference. And I think those are our are, are, uh, research oriented jargon that we have to be very descriptive, both from the tangible elements when we generate data, as well as the intangible. And when you try to monetize those kinds of data, that's where the methodology uh, has to be uh, reliable and, and set the limitations on how it could be used. It's not a, a one size fits all or, or a funding solution. It's just that we're, we have a common understanding on how it could be interpreted. You know, and your discussion reminds me of uh, both Senator Lee and I are members of the Association of Pacific Island Legislators. And one, one of the resolutions that I, that I had, um, and we both worked really hard at trying to think of things regionally um, in all kinds of ways. Uh, but one of the resolutions I had was just calling upon us as a region to, especially for those areas where people are leaving to come to places like Guam, Anamai, and Hawaii, is to encourage them to 
um, open up offices that can really educate and arm their people before they leave so that they know what they're walking into. They have a support system when they get here, hopefully, you know, because if people are going to migrate, we, we want it to be successful for them. And I think that's a really important consideration. So the more that they know beforehand, the more that they're making informed choices. And hopefully when they get to places like Guam or Hawaii or California or Arkansas or Michigan or um, any of the many places now, that uh, they, they have those understandings. They understand maybe some of the legal and cultural differences between how our laws work, our governments work, our cultures and expectations work so that they feel comfortable and feel like they can succeed in all the many changes that they'll be dealing with. Um, but if we move on to the calculations, both looking at maybe some of the history of the issues of it and some of the direction we're going in. Senator Lee, did you have uh, questions you wanted to ask in this regard? Sure, thank you, Madam Chair. So I just really wanted to kind of hone in on um, affected jurisdictions like Hawaii, like Guam, like the NMI. Um, have we ever come together to agree on kind of a standardized calculation of impact costs? I know, um, Senator Carlotta earlier was mentioning about um, GAO and, and how they kind of um, have worked to be uniform. Um, but I was also just wondering from our perspective and from the other affected jurisdictions, have we kind of worked together to try to be uniform on our end? Um, and if so, what, what has been different from our past local calculations? What I would say is that uh, the government of Guam has been the most consistent in submitting reports, um, well-documented reports. And uh, it's just in the last year or so when the government of Guam said, we're going to tackle methodology. Um, Hawaii will have gaps where they won't submit anything for five years or so. Um, the CNMI might have only submitted one or two reports over the last 10 or 12 years. So, and the other juris affected jurisdictions if you're in a state with um, um, like California with you know, tens of millions of people, it, it gets buried. It's not as big a, of an item as it is to any, any of us. So their impacts are felt, but they're not felt to the degree that, 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 we're, that we, we feel it, I think. Um, I don't know if that helps to explain. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much. That was really important to, to ask, I think, because I think too often we do work separately and we forget. We have brothers and sisters in the Pacific, brothers and sisters in Micronesia and, and um, amongst the territories. And then of course in the larger family uh, amongst territories and states. So I really appreciate that because I think um, if we're working together instead of everybody reinventing the wheel separately, like we're gonna, Get, you know, we're, we're going to have a, a firmer chance of getting somewhere and, and having strength in numbers as well. So I really appreciate that. Um, if, if, I, if, yeah. if I could add to that, if I, if I could add to that, um, the, we support Hawaii's efforts. Hawaii's efforts every year are to get everybody from Micronesia back on to Medicaid. So all of our congressional leaders, we have always supported that. And the governor is now taking that, and pushed it further, trying to get it expanded in, into Micronesia. The other effort that Guam has been pushing over these years, and we can go into it a bit more uh, tomorrow, but is debt relief. And we are identified as trying to say, we, you owe us money. And now you say, we owe you money, let's swap debt. So we've had different layers of support from, yeah, we've had different layer uh, uh, members of Congress that have supported our efforts on that. So the way we, we and, and right now, if you read this latest GAO report, all of these jurisdictions know 
that Guam has taken the lead on tackling methodology. And they've, they've submitted letters into the GAO saying, okay, we are excited and we're standing back to see what Guam is gonna do. So Guam has taken the lead on tackling this, no pressure, Dr. Barcinas, <laughs> but uh, uh, Guam is the, the leader of the pack. It's, it's further out and all these governors, if you see the letters from these governors, they're all saying, okay, go Guam. We're, we'll wait to see what Guam comes up with. Thank you so much, Senator. I think that's really important to, to note. And I really want to thank everybody uh, for participating on this call. I think it's a good first step, Madam Chair. I'm looking forward to continued discussions tomorrow, but also just a really timely um, discussion. You know, as you know, we're all in the middle of this budget session and we are hemming and hawing over all of these millions of dollars. And here we have, you know, upwards of 140, 150 million dollars annually. And, you know, we're not even positive about the total number. And so this is something that's really costly to our community. Um, and we want to make sure that we, we have it addressed. So I really appreciate this discussion. Thank you very much. Definitely. Um, so continuing what I, I was saying, I was going to ask um, for the GAO, has the Government Accountability Office, have they ever given us guidance? I know for the last 12 or 14 or since, ever since, they've told us we're not on the track and right track. And um, I really like what uh, Senator Leon Guerrero was sharing. It's one of those moments that we are taking the lead. And it is something for Guam to, um, to be feeling proud about. I, I, I think that we've been consistent in our reporting, maybe the most consistent, and that yeah. we're taking the lead. Um, and we're really working hard to try to make a difference. So like, uh, like uh, Senator Leon Guerrero said, uh, no pressure for the UOG team carrying it out. <laughs> Um, but, you know, have we ever really gotten any direct um, yes. assistance from GAO to, to tell us this is what you need to do as a correct formula? Or has it been that, no, it, it doesn't meet our standard and sort of work it out? The answer is yes. Yes. We, in, oh. in, 20, in 2013, uh, the GAO reported report identified five areas with, of concern with respect to accuracy for uh, compact uh, impact reporting. Uh, <coughs> sorry. And um, one of them is revenue. This refers to taxes and fees paid by the migrants. That's that section where how do you calculate the positive impact that you get if, you know, uh, everybody in your, uh, the majority of the people in your hotel are, are, your hotel couldn't be opened if they weren't there, that sort of thing. So how do you calculate that? But one of the things that they threw in here that is very interesting, and I would say, you know, to Dr. Barcinas and everybody else here, is that um, they, they felt that we are overstating that we're not deducting enough federal funds. We, they think that we're uh, um, taking too many bites of the apple, that, we're, that we could be taking some federal funding out of what we're claiming. So they think that we overstate. But then they come in and they say that, and this was stunning, is they said that where the government of Guam understates is we do not claim capital cost. So we only claim the cost for services that we're providing, but we've never claimed that we had to build that fire station or that new school or that new recreation center or uh, additional wells. So they say, they, they, they whack us <laughs> for over uh, um, counting, over reporting. They think we need to deduct more, but then they threw that in there. And the only one that ever tried to calculate uh, capital cost was the CNMI like in 97 or 98. And when the CNMI tried it, they said, this police station is this old, this is how much uh, mortgage is left on it, it serves this many people, this is the impact. They did water systems, they did roads, they came up with this. And Interior and everybody blew their minds. They, they said, how can we deal with them? Uh, oh my gosh. And so everybody, Hawaii, Guam, all of us got scared when you see the CNMI get beat up so bad for daring to propose capital cost. So we never did. When you see that big resounding, no, 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 don't go down there. 
And then, so that was like uh, in 97 or so when they tried that. So to see in 2013, GAO saying we should be claiming capital cost. I think that's a positive. I'm, I'm glad they're saying that because it is a reality. I think for our agencies, and I'm so glad they're here for like uh, Gura and public health, they get basically a double whammy. They, um, because all of our budget is a hundred, you know, let's, we don't know the actual accurate number, but let's say it's a hundred or $120 million short of the obligations of those US treaties. Um, and then the unfunded mandates as Senator Joe was saying. And so we don't have enough to, to give them that's adequate and, and yet they're trying to do more with less at the same time. And, and so, yeah, if we can make some differences and if the US federal government will um, respond, then I think we'll get somewhere. So those are some of the issues. Um, maybe uh, Mr. Barcinas and, and Dr. Dresbach, if, if you want to mention a little bit, I know you don't have the, the calculations fully figured out yet, but um, maybe you could help us understand a little bit about the road you're going down to try to tweak these calculations. I know that they're going to have to be much more complex. And so for entities like public health, um, GMH, we've talked to them a little bit and, and it doesn't, it, it's not going to just be a simple uh, documenting that they're from a particular area and of a particular ethnicity. It's going to have to be a lot more complex than that, it seems. Uh, but maybe you could speak a little bit about the direction you're going in uh, to help us with the study. I can I can explain the the role of the university and and how we were uh, approached to help uh, address the answering the big methodology question and I think when you get involved in these kinds of, of formal research you really have to structure research the research flow process in the right way so that the credibility of the study is not only recognized but it's now there for for addressing transparency. This is how it could be used. I think the what we what we try to define is what would be the best approach to answer all these complex questions. And I mentioned earlier, uh, d using a uh, COFA impact monograph. And a mon the monograph speaks to what uh, Carlotta mentioned, the five areas. And I think uh, what we tried to also focus on is to set priorities on which of the five areas are the most uh, cross-cutting across the uh, uh, area of services that Gulf Guam struggles with. And I think this is understanding the uh, conceptual framework, which is when you say, what, what does healthcare look like to a, a, uh, a COFA migrant? Well, it depends on which agency you're trying to focus on. So there's these areas we, we framed under the uh, issues monograph, public safety, healthcare, revenue, which addresses the workforce development angle, uh, the built capital, which addresses all the uh, scenarios around if you build a hospital, how is it being supported with local funds? And I think that's one of the GAO points is how do you extract out the federal dollars? So we, we go back to those baseline uh, data series and really evaluate the culture of how is it being collected? And most importantly, how is it being used across regular reporting for Gulf Guam as a whole? But then now more specifically so that there's no gaps in the way it's being used, how then can we use it in a input output model, which is really the, the economics behind it? So one of the, the early discussions on how to approach the cost benefit analysis is to use certain data economic uh, software and try to localize that platform for Guam to use for model development. 
so that when we we build the capacity within agencies to share uh, common data series that support the uh, issue monographs, like the health monograph would would capture all the data series that Guam needs to, to capture for all its official reporting. But more importantly for this research, we wanna now have a set aside to really focus on how does this look within the context of the COFA migrant experience in terms of the, the services that they access. So when you use the built capital reference, uh, if GPD's uh, latest building in Sinahanya, what pot of money went to that? So we have to really, and I think this is something that we found in, in discussions with our, our pre-discussions with our con uh, content experts, is that the data might, might exist in aggregate forms. And all we need to do is our version of forensic accounting and, and show how we could uh, disaggregate them into some official reference that now has to be guided by uh, our governance process for the agencies that have those mandates. And I think that's part of the, of the evolution of trying to address where are we today in, in terms of our existing way of reporting. And then how do we, we, we bounce to the next layer of compliant reporting and then uh, built on the next level of linking that data to policy that is owned by us and not something that we're trying to report just for purposes of saying this is our, these are the numbers. I think that's, that's the angle that it's easy to say that, but when you get into the inner sanctums of the, the culture of how we report, uh, across agencies, it really deals with the human dimension and the policy processes. So the monograph begins to set in place a platform for common reporting of data series, as well as also ensuring that the confidentiality and accessing the data is maintained because the government's interest is one thing. But when you start going in and saying, I want data on health issues related to this particular population. The research process allows us to be very sensitive to that. And I think there are ways to do it. And under a research uh, approach, those things can be addressed. So we have our local uh, network of content experts uh, being, um, um, I guess, our, our pre-meetings and then hopefully getting them on board to to begin the formality of looking at existing data sets uh, and then also building the models that would be appropriate to speak to the cost benefit analysis side. And then from that model, we can evaluate the indicators and metrics that would be appropriate to, to share as well as building the transparency components so that no one challenges it once we, we put it out there. And I think we want to make sure that this is not that catch-all for reporting, but it's a start point to being compliant. And I think the, the letter that uh, Carlotta mentioned to Interior is that the idea of pausing what we're doing today is, is something that this is still a, a high interest to the government of Guam, but we also want to get these issues addressed before going further down the road only to know that we're not on the right road. We wanna, we wanna make it clear on how those uh, pathways are illuminated for not only us at this point of this discussion, but those that are gonna inherit this kind of reporting going forward. It, yeah, you know, you made me think of several things. Um, the, I'll, I'll tackle the first one, the most immediate one. How long does it take to get feedback? So let's say, I mean, the study's going to go on. We're going to hopefully um, improve our calculations. How long does it typically take after we, we submit a report for us to hear back um, whether it has or has not met the muster? Or is it gonna happen a little bit differently? Are they gonna be in communication with us before we actually submit and, and there's some open communication already? 
part of the study approach is to include all the work groups that would be part of the, the conversation and defining their roles. And I think Monica alluded to this. We want GAO, when, when GAO visited the university to look at how we're treating uh, uh, students from Micronesia, there are common data series that we report on, but then it's only being used for the work of the university. What we wanna do is, is look at the intangible and the tangible references of how that data addresses the broader issues beyond just the university environment. So what we wanna do is, is you know, speak to that in the right way, but not leave it wide open because again, it depends on who's looking at it. You could tell so many different storylines that uh, we'll just get overwhelmed with uh, the issues behind those stories. What was interesting in that GAO meeting was that they wanted to see the study that we're, we were doing and we didn't even start yet, but that was part of the conversation that they're acknowledging that we're putting them on the, on the docket that their report is not just to Congress, but is also a report that the federal government uh, has to be sensitive to. Yeah, and I think we've we've learned a lot by combing through those reports and picking up on what uh, their their comments have been, their critiques have been in there. Um, so I think I've heard, but correct me if if I haven't heard correctly, um, that we're going to start with maybe a pilot, like a pilot program, like maybe looking at GDOE first, or maybe something like public health first. Um, are we going to pick an entity that, that we can absolutely get those more complex understandings from and, and kind of see how that goes before we spread it out to all the agencies? One of the, the, the grant requirements, there are specific deliverables that we have to really uh, stick with. And I think one of the, the concerns is uh, helping build that capacity in the agencies. So the approach is looking at what are the big issues uh, that really uh, requires our short term. Uh, let's look at this a little bit closely and, and begin that modeling and looking at that conceptual framework to access the data, to make it compliant, and then to use it in the right way for reporting. And I think for the initial approach, we're recommending as a work group to look at uh, the health sector, education, and um, public safety. And our framework uses the term intersectionality. When, when you look at public safety, and let's say you focus on GPD, when you, you do a data flow process of a, a public safety transaction, you could already see the, the uh, audit trail of how that case intersects with, it depends on who you're going to. So you're looking at judiciary, you're looking at the AG's office, you're looking at uh, all the DOC. So that's the complexity of what's really hidden in the layers of government transactions and more so how the current reporting of COFA data is being used to capture those uh, particular complexities. So the modeling is what we're trying to establish so that when we get those protocols in place, it could almost be the, the, uh, the case scenario for other agencies to to address when they uh, ramp up their reporting to this methodology. And um, I, I do wanna move on to uh, GURA and public health in just a minute, but if you could tell me, how long is this study meant to be going on? I understand um, we're all dealing with the issues of COVID uh, slowing down progress, but, but what is the timeline for this study? Juan? Oh, there I am. Hello? Yes. Oh, can you hear me? Oh, hi. hi. Yep. Yeah, with regard to the grant, the grant is good until uh, it expires in 2022. 
So there are two product deliverables. One is the economic contributions of the compact migrants, and the other one is the development of the uh, method, statistical methodology. So uh, the way the grant was written when we had submitted it, the first product uh, deliverable is the economic contributions, which uh, I understand it would be uh, September of 2021. And uh, statistical methodology is in August of 2022. But our, our intent is actually to uh, emphasis to get the methodology in place first. So there's nowhere that the grant prohibits us in, in completing the deliverable much earlier than expected. Okay, so that gives us some, some solid numbers and, and hopefully um, in the face of COVID, we'll still be able to move forward in an in ex, in ex, expedient matter. So I, I know with uh, Gura and Public Health and, and some of the other entities that we have been communicating with, that you guys have probably been, been uh, gathering some of these numbers for a real long time. So for Mr. Tapasna, have you, have you seen changes over time in the way that you calculate um, people that are availing themselves of, of Gura's services? Um, yeah, maybe well, you could give us a little bit of your perspective there. Well, uh, specific to this, um, to this topic, um, Gura's uh, role would be limited to, of course, housing, homelessness, and uh, to a great extent, uh, community development uh, projects such as police stations, fire stations. Um, yes, we in fact have collected data over the years. And with respect to, uh, I'll talk about um, our two major housing programs, uh, Section 8, uh, we, we get anywhere between 30 to $37 million a year. Uh, and in that program alone, we're, uh, we're looking at about 39% of the head of households that are actually uh, from the freely associated states. Uh, with, with respect to our public housing program, we have 750 public housing units from Maritsu up to Derido. And uh, collectively, we, we house about 40% from the uh, freely associated states. So that, that's pretty significant. Between the two housing programs, it's a, close to about $40 million. And so if you take 39, 40% of that, that, I mean, if you were to just look at it simplistically, it's, it's pretty significant. And then as well, we have our community development block grants. And uh, as Pete Barcinas mentioned, we built the, the uh, Central Precinct Command in Sinahania. That's about a $4.1 million project. And we have a lot of other, um, we just recently um, broke ground to the uh, Central Community Arts Hall in Sinahania. And we have a number of projects. We have the Mong Mong Totu Mighty basketball court that will be breaking ground soon uh, as well. The, uh, we have a, something that we're really uh, proud of, a women treatment center in Tizen, a drug rehab center. And uh, that's about a $2.6 million project. So we, we just have a number of community development projects, uh, all federal funds. So I'm not certain whether the, um, whether the compact impact calculations are taking all of these things into account or whether the, the, whether the feds would uh, even want to consider uh, some of these concerns because everything we do is uh, fully, fully funded. But it, it does have a great impact if I can talk about housing because if 40% of, of the families that we provide a home to are from the freely associated states. Basically what that means is a US citizen, a, a, a local family will be displaced. And we anticipate it'll even get worse um, post COVID. Uh, we recently opened the wait list for our section eight program. We, um, just for a week, Monday through Friday, uh, Monday at I believe uh, eight in the morning. And then we shut down the list at 
uh, 12 midnight on Friday. And we had about 9,200 uh, attempts to apply for Section 8. So it's quite significant. There's, um, we don't have the, the statistics on, on how many of that, of that would be uh, from uh, the freely associated states, but we, we do know that we, th those are record numbers. We've never had anything uh, even close to that. So do we expect it to get worse? Absolutely. And uh, we're, um, the, the funding is limited. We uh, uh, not had uh, a major increase in funding. Uh, this year we did, we had about a $7 million increase to our Section 8 budget, but that was primarily because we increased our payment standards to landlords. But aside from that, the money's pretty constant, and hasn't been hasn't really increased over the years, and uh, the numbers are progressively increasing. Those are definitely really important statistics and, and numbers uh, for us to be aware of. And I think the information you're sharing here is really going to help us. Um, today, but also it creates a really strong foundation for our discussion tomorrow night as well as when we we talk about maybe if there are any possibilities for addressing or mitigating some of these impacts. And I can see in the way that you're explaining it, the complexity. If it's federal money, but it's also part of our, our capital issues that are coming up, how to navigate through all of that to come out with a number. And, and you know, as you were saying, that 60% of, of others, and then knowing that there are these really kind of uh, record-breaking numbers of people on waiting lists, there, there's maybe a numerical or fiscal value to that, that, um, that needs to be calculated in some way as well, because um, we, we do, we have so many people, probably both FAS citizens and other Guam residents that are being affected by this. So yeah, I can see the need for software to um, navigate through all of that complexity. <laughs> So thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, Senator Lee, did you have a question for Gura before we move on to public health? I don't, Madam Chair, but I did want to just see if Senator St. Augustine had any comments um, to our discussion. Yes, uh, that would be very good as well. Oh, you know, Madam Chair, um, I noticed on the chat that they're identifying there's so much money. And I know for a fact, because I oversee also Gura and Guam Housing, and I understand that, you know, this is the percentage. It tells you a lot. Um, and, and I always refer back to DOE, who sees it up front as part of the registration. And I'm really hoping uh, Senator Collada and, and the crew, Mr. Barcinas and everybody else, they're able to put together that formula and they get the federal government to, to pay us for what we're doing to house everybody here, the compact impact, because it, it's taking its toll on the budget. The budget is taking a beating. Um, every time uh, Gura comes up and builds a fire station to accommodate everybody, we got to take a look at, uh, we look at DOE and we're like, oh, we got to increase schools. Thank God we got charter schools, we got private schools, but we're going to run out of room. And then at the same time, uh, GMH is taking a beating because if they can't pay for their, their hospital bills, the government will not turn away anybody. And, you know, Senator Collard is there saying that, yep, uh, and that's what we're dealing with. And, and, and if you just take the three folks that Mr. Barcina has brought up, you're looking at DU, uh, education, public health, and public safety. You can actually take a look at what is the number and the percentage we have at DOC. And, and, and we can just go around and, and, the, and the dollar just keeps adding up. So I'm really looking forward that they, they settle the formula and we get some relief in Gov Guam because um, the people of Guam, the residents of Guam are, are, are actually put in the bill and we need to share this because we're not going to chase anybody away. We, you know, that's, that's Guam. Come on to Guam, you know, not a problem, but put for both, uh, take a look at, at the expense that everybody's footing and, and let's just work as, as one family, one island. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. To Joe Massey for that. And yeah, I mean, part of this is the calculation, but 
but um, I like what Senator Lee was mentioning and, and uh, Senator Leon Guerrero um, and others about we, we need to have unity, we need to come together, we need to work together because I, I worry a bit that even if we get our calculation right, what then, right? Um, they can tell us it's right, but if they're not changing the way they reimburse us, then, then that's a real concern. Um, so I'd also uh, like to, to ask Public Health, uh, their director is here, and I apologize uh, that these become rather long, um, but they are such complex issues, so I apologize for the length of waiting, but we would really like to hear from Public Health, your perspective, maybe the different ways you've been um, gathering this data over the years and whether you've seen changes or have um, any thoughts into the, the changes from your perspective? Absolutely. Um, good evening, Senator uh, Marsh Titano, Madam Chair, Senator Viscoli, Senator Joseph Augustine, and former Senator uh, Carlotta. In terms of public health and social services, I have two other division chiefs with me, Dr. Kenneth Shiro, oversees the Division of Public Health, and Tess Clark Angel, who oversees the Division of Public Welfare. But what I do have is our compact impact report. And so for the last 14 years, our cumulative costs for FAS costs is 180 million. In terms of the last three years, 15, 16, and 17, in 2015, our cost for FAS cost is 13 million, 99.27. In FY 2016, it's 17 million, 358, 199. And most recent data we have on record is FY 2017 is $19,614,87. In terms of how we have been managing the report for some of the divisions, and I'll have uh, both Tesk and uh, Dr. Kaneshiro, Tesk Archangel and Dr. Kaneshiro also chime in on this, is in one division in particular, it's only based on local dollars. Local dollars in one division, there are funds that are overmatched. So the report that would be submitted is only for that portion that is 100% locally funded. Uh, in the calculation that we were advised to use, it would be not to include federally funded programs. So if it's already federally funded, you couldn't get reimbursed on funds that are already issued or awarded through the federal government. In terms of perhaps a uh, of ethnicity and the larger number of residents who would come through our program. Uh, Tess Archangel and Dr. Kanishiro, if you would please uh, share information that you may have in your respective divisions. Uh, the Division of Public Health runs our community health centers. And so there's a myriad of programs that they operate. And then of course, many of us know the Division of Public Welfare. They run our Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP. They also run MIP and Medicaid. So, Dr. Kanishiro and Tesco Archangel, if you would please share any information with the group of uh, individuals on our discussion this evening. Thank you. Yes, so we do uh, uh, see patients from the uh, free association and we track, the, we do track it in our, our UDS system. So we can calculate how much um, how much of our services actually go to this particular population. So we do report on that. With regards to uh, Division of Public Welfare, we also report our expense. This is Tress Archangel, by the way. With regards to Division of Public Welfare, we also report our expenditure, especially on Medicaid and on MIP. Uh, in fiscal year 2018, the, the total number of FAS citizens under the MIP program is 76%. And on Medicaid, it's about 25%. And the total expenditure of FAS citizens under the Medicaid program as per uh, the latest is 2018 is 30 million. This includes the MIP emergency services that we charge to Medicaid. And so under MIP, there will be, there is roughly around uh, 6 million that, uh, uh, the expend, that are the expenditure for the FAS citizens. 
And um, I know uh, we have different capabilities. With your iPad, is it possible, uh, since you're speaking with us right now, to put on your camera? Or uh, uh, I know some people I'm trying. I'm <laughs> I'm trying to live with other iPads. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm using my iPhone. I'm trying to, I'm trying to look for how I'm there. Uh, that's the one. Sorry. Well, there we go. <laughs> okay. okay. It's, good to, it's good to see you. And, and thank you for that information. You know, um, with Guam, I know for a long time, we really have been trying to be diligent uh, about collecting this data. And um, it is good that we're now understanding that it needs to be done in this more complex way to better reflect the impacts. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I guess part of what makes it, um, I mean, there are just so many, probably you can point in any direction and you can come across a complexity, but um, when, when the children are born here or the grandchildren are born here, um, I think that that changes things as well. Is, is that correct, Mr. Barcenas? What we want, what our approach is to try and understand all facets of the issue. And we really have to make sure that the integrity of how the local population, whether they qualify under the ethnicity language, how they're treated, whether they are just regular citizens or regular users of the service. Once we start putting the labels to how the data should be filtered, that's where we really have to make sure that it's tr the transparency concerns are there because it, it presents other issues. And I just like to note that there's a lot of data that uh, was just shared and I'll be knocking on, on your door, Ray and Art, <laughs> for uh, having the, uh, the people that are the uh, gatekeepers for these data series. I think a lot of the work is, is there and I like how public health has already begun and, and Ray already tracking those numbers. What we wanna do is now if you look at the other government agencies and ask, do you do, you do the same level of data integrity and, and capture? And are you doing it manually or through an automated system? And I think those are some of the gaps that we want to identify so that uh, there's uniformity in the reporting standard. So I think we're on track. I wish GDOE was in, in, the, in the conversation. Yeah, you know, we had considered uh, GDOE as well because um, I think part of it is as well that not everybody necessarily can as easily gain the level of information as we're finding may be necessary, but GDOE, I believe, and maybe public health and, and GURA would also fall into this, these categories, that they, that they do gather a fair amount of detailed uh, information, which is really important. But I think maybe of all of them, uh, maybe GDOE gathers the most detail and, and have worked at some of trying to tackle some of this formula and methodology and, and these issues as well. So um, I would love to have a follow-up and, and definitely hear from more of our agencies. Yes, uh, Senator. Senator, if I, if I could add something about uh, DOE. Um, so since um, the governor uh, came into office and I've been working with uh, Bureau of Plans, um, what we did is we approached uh, DOE, and we asked them to give us the best number that they could, um, take every federal funding funding out of it, give us the most defensible number that we could. And so we are loading that up for a movement on debt relief. So the figures that we have on education have been the most agreed upon figures throughout the history of, of um this relationship. 
And the methodology is the methodology that was in place for decades and decades when uh, people from the military were in our schools. So that was a federal policy that put a military kid in a school. So this is a federal policy that puts a Micronesian kid into our school. So um, DOE pretty much counts it the same way. And that methodology on how you calculate uh, a, a student in your school system is the same methodology that Hawaii uses. So it's like an idea that the director of Bureau of Stats and Plans that I had, which was to bifurcate education out of this, get the best number that we can. So if we look at all of our reports going back over time, we're up over a billion dollars. There's a realization that that gets into the world of unbelievable, you know? And so what is the biggest number that is most defensible that we could start to prepare, that we could say this number for debt relief. If we're gonna to say to the federal government, we don't wanna do matching or we don't wanna pay back that federal uh, um, fund, what do, we, what do we put it up against? And we think that the most defensible numbers right now are education, DOE. So that's what DOE has been doing uh, is they've been working with us. And so I was gonna go into more detail about that strategy in tomorrow's session, but you know, yeah, I had yeah. to stand up for DOE right now because uh, that they, they've been working on something with Bureau of Plans, with us, the governor's office in a strategy. Excellent, excellent. Well, I think we've covered a lot of really good ground all the way from what is compact impact to what is the reimbursement and, and why does it all even exist? You know, and uh, again, a lot of this boils down to having those treaty agreements between the US and those freely associated states. And then therefore, there are those US obligations that came along with it. So for uh, any of the senators or for anybody in the panel, was there anybody who wanted to give any last question or last comments? Can I say something? Uh, this is Ray yes. from Laura. Absolutely. Um, one of the things I forgot to mention, and I'm not sure whether um, Pete Barcinas might be interested in this, but uh, the, Part, part of our mandate is also to try and combat homelessness. Uh, the most recent point in time count uh, for, uh, which was uh, done in January of this year, it, uh, pegged us at 790 homeless individuals on this island. That's a significant drop from the previous year. The thing is, even if you if you divide 790 into 165,000 population, that puts us probably in the top five per capita in terms of homelessness. You know, we're up there with um, Hawaii and Washington DC and Seattle or, or Washington, the state of Washington. So, you know, that's something I think um, for some reason, uh, Gora hasn't been tracking that um, in previous years, but, you know, using HUD's um, formula or their methodology and we're not even any of their in any of their reports, but if you look at it on a per capita basis, uh, Guam is right in the top five, um, together with some of the uh, problem areas of the United States. So I I'm not sure whether that's something we want to track as part of the uh, compact impact uh, calculation. But you know, trying to combat homelessness comes with a cost, and a good portion of our homeless population are migrants from the other islands. So that, I think that's something worth mentioning. I really appreciate you, you bringing that up. Um, it's relevant in just so many ways. And uh, some of the discussion that we've had, um, like the resolution that I had, and um, I know some of the work that Senator Lee and, and Senator Leon Guerrero have done are really about providing people with those tools, like I said, so that when they come here or Hawaii or somewhere else, uh, Michigan, that, that they're armed for as much success as we can try to guarantee them. And, you know, um, and um, we want to resolve these, these issues and they're really difficult ones. They're complex in a lot of ways and, and multi-layered. Have you, 
looked, um, Mr. Barcines, have you looked at um, how homelessness and, and people who are homeless or in substandard housing, how they would be calculated in? I think the how how again we're uh, it's important on how we conceptualize what is it what are the big research questions we want to address in in this context, and I think the one of the monograph areas that we are trying to address is the uh, quality of life reference. So if we were to, to develop uh, indicators and metrics along those lines, we definitely can then focus on the um, the kinds of questions that Ray is racing and look at the methodology of how those data points are being used. And then I guess the, 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 the big interest area is the multiplier reference. How does this translate into both negative and positive uh, concerns? And I think right now it's more of just understanding how we, we compile and access the data and then from there is, is evaluating the quality of the data series and identifying are these the right metrics to use to report out what it is, it is we are trying to get our hands around. And the number might be going down on the, on the homeless count, but the realities of how these families and individuals impact other programs is, is just as daunting. Uh, you have probably veterans that are homeless and if you match that up to uh, federal funds and other programs, there's just so many interplay. And that's the whole nature of the intersectionality framework. How, how are we touching that? And then more importantly, how are we reporting on it? And then to uh, Senator St. Augustine, how does that look in terms of a budget for an agency? Because it's one thing to provide services and get funded properly. It's another to tell the story and then we just leave it on the table. Yeah, and, and um, the more I hear about the direction the study is going in and the more that I hear from uh, the personnel at the public health and at Gura and our other agencies, you know, it it really helps me understand the intensive work that's going on for our community. And I'm just so appreciative for, uh, for all of it because you know, the problems don't solve themselves. We have to roll up our sleeves and tackle them. And, and I see all of you are really working at wanting to tackle them. So uh, I'm glad we had those last comments and, and responses. I think that really added to some of what we covered. With that, I'll go ahead and uh, start the closing. So I wanted to give um, a reminder, sorry, let me just make sure I'm in the right place. Yes, a reminder that the committee will continue to receive any written comments about today's virtual informational briefing. Please address your written testimony to the Committee on Heritage and the Arts, Parks, Guam Products, Hagatnya Revitalization, Self-Determination and Regional Affairs, and submit it via email to office.senatorkelly at guamlegislature.org or deliver it to my office at, located on the second floor of the Guam Congress building. So with uh, there being no further comments and questions and any ones we think of between now and tomorrow, we'll have a whole nother joint informational briefing to continue these discussions and build on them for tomorrow. I'm really looking forward to that. So there being none, the committee will adjourn this joint virtual informational briefing. To do us maasi, to everyone here, you stuck it out. You came after the five o'clock, you know, long work day. So I really, really appreciate everybody for, for coming out and for all of your patience as we went around and, and um, it took a while to get to everybody. So I thank you for your attendance and participation in today's uh, joint virtual informational briefing. The time is now 7.25. Please have a good evening and to do a smart